Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, please, please take your seats. Now, this next session is on cruise tourism. We're going to have a cruise executive panel, um, the future of cruise. Um, this presentation will and discussion will be held in German, so if you don't understand German, please go and get one of the little um, babble fish um, that they have outside, and that will translate it for you in, in real time. So before I hand over to the, the moderator for this session and the experts on cruise lines, um, we have another live voting question that we'd like to start this session with. We've all heard that there is this boom in cruise tourism. So the questions to you, and you have the clickers to your right, I think. They're hanging on this, off the side of your chair. Um, will the cruise industry boom continue over the next few years? Yes, no, it's weakening, or no, it will be over soon. So please cast your votes now. Yes, that's a very clear signal, <laughs> and I think that's just in line with the, um, with the panel that we're about to have here. So please introduce, I'd like to introduce Thomas Illis, who will be hosting this panel. He is a, um, an analyst for, cru for the cruise industry, uh, a journalist, as well as a teacher at universities. So Thomas, the David. stage is all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy. Welcome. Welcome and welcome. Ich darf klar. Well, if you see this, then you can give a great hand. The question is whether we should have an applause. A lot of people might think uh, maybe it's too much growth. We can discuss this now. But I would like to um, welcome my renowned panelists. First of all, who doesn't know him, I suppose? If you are familiar with the sector, you know Michael Singler, the managing director of MSC Cruises. MSC Kreuzfahrten Deutschland Cruises in Germany, one of the most important companies in the field. So he's really familiar with the market and he knows what to do. So asked to uh, retain an upper hand in the market. Wherever you would like to take a seat, please. And Kevin Bubolds from Norwegian Cruise Line Vice President, Managing Director of Norwegian Cruise Line Europe. Kevin Bubolz, welcome. I'm pleased to have two renowned representatives of cruise companies here with us. We were thinking about who to invite to the panel this year, to the cruise executive panel, and we decided to have two um, shipping companies represented here, who, which are uh, active in a volume market. I think we can say this with regard to MSC and Norwegian Cruise Line. They are volume shipping companies in part. I say this because they also have experience in the field of luxury travels. These are the two shipping companies They've got MSC on the one hand, MSC Yacht Club and Haven from Norwegian. These are separated uh, concepts, and there they also serve the luxury market. It is very interesting to have a mainstream um, ship on the one hand, and you've got a luxury product on the ship. They were not the pioneers, by the way, but I think you can say that you were kind of the first. Who, implemented that vigorously. So it will be interesting to debate this. What are the differences in marketing and in profitability of the mass market, the so-called volume market or the mainstream market, whatever you want to call it. The US Americans have a very beautiful term. They say contemporary market. Although, well, regarding Norwegian, I don't know whether this is very befitting. You're responsible for shipping company which enters the premium segment. Maybe we can discuss this, whether this is possible with 4,000 passengers and how you do it, etc., etc. Right, and both are uh, growing. And there's one point that is interesting. One is a private shipping company, uh, MSC. It's a family-run private company. No figures you can look up. 
and the other shipping company is uh, listed on the stock exchange. They've got completely different conditions regarding entering uh, into businesses and such to communicate figures. The, I, th I suppose this would be very interesting to compare these two. Right, so we've got quite a few things that we can discuss today. First of all, I've got a question. Maybe you can indicate by a show of hands, who of you has ever been on a cruise? Right, this is quite a few people. Now, of those who have never been on a cruise ship, who would say, I'd never, ever go on a cruise trip? Are there any people? Just, you can, you can uh, tell you. There are few and far in between. And a third question, of those who've not ever done a cruise, uh, would like to go on a cruise ship? Okay, that's the majority. And this, I suppose, is what you've seen here on the <coughs> chart. that there's really a boom in the cruise industry. Right, when talking about growth, first question to you, to Mr. Sengler. Well, what I've I heard by Oculus de Hum, the uh, head of sales of MSC, he said, we want to grow, we want to order many ships, and they do order quite a few ships. The question is, what do we calculate? two newly bit ships that were delivered and now you will have an additional 10, so 12 altogether. So this is twice as much as far as the fleet is concerned and is three times higher passenger capacity within 10 years. This is quite impressive. Before we uh, talk about Norwegian cruise lines, I'd like to ask you, are there any moments in time in your life, Mr. Tengeler, when you say, when you wake up in the night and say, and ask God, please uh, make sure that my management will not order another ship from one day to the next? Do you have these moments in time when you think about these things? Well, uh, what links Kevin and myself is that we spent some time together at NCL. And it was in 2002 that I joined NCL. And since 2002, I'm uh, being asked regularly, is there still growth potential with regard to cruises? And every time I say, in rather credible terms, yes, there is some potential. And also believe that this additional capacity can be used to the full, simply because the potential is huge. And people who go on a cruise today is really only a few. You need to think about it. I think it's 2.5% uh, in Germany of 81 million inhabitants. So 2.5% of the German population have made a cruise, have gone on a cruise. And suppose in 2017, the cruise industry market uh, grew in Germany by approximately uh, slightly more than 10%. And the average prices uh, are increasing slightly, I suppose. This is very specific. On the one hand, you say that the market is growing, but the average prices are also increasing. Yes, it's a healthy demand. This is what I am saying. And 2.5% of all Germans, this is very, very uh, few. So there is still uh, some potential, according to studies, Every fifth German, so one in five, can imagine to go on a cruise ship. They would like to go on a cruise ship in any case, if I'm not mistaken. So that would be 20% if I've calculated this in the right terms. This might be slightly exaggerated, but I suppose that six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent <coughs> might be, uh, well, a realistic figure. And this is two or three times more than what we can see today. So there is a demand. So you do not have sleepless nights, says the host. No, I can sleep very well. No problems there. Right. The head of sales, I mentioned the head of sales of MSC uh, Cruises, Achilles Machado. I didn't tell you what he said. He said, we are growing. We need so many ships that others can't enter. What does it mean? We've got a, a limited number of wharfs. Uh, only a few can build these ships at all. And he told me without blushing, he said, we order ships so that the competitors simply won't get any slots as far as the shipbuilding in the wharfs is concerned. This is an interesting statement. But uh, let us take a look at your growth, Kevin, because you also grow, maybe not as quickly, but still. 
And you get Bliss, Norwegian Bliss, uh, soon. And next year, you'll have another ship from the breakaway plus class, as it is called, Norwegian Encore, and then you'll have a break, right? But MSC, Mr. Tengler doesn't do any breaks. He will simply continue. And as of 2022, there will be the new Leonardo ships, right? Exactly. Now, before talking about your growth, are you wondering sometimes, just honestly, are you wondering whether this is profitable, MSC? I don't think that you can give me an honest answer, but I still I would like to ask the question, do you not ask yourself sometimes, uh, will it be possible to manage what MSC is doing at the moment? Well, we don't really look into what other companies do, but we rather focus on ourselves. And we do have strong growth as well. We can't uh, keep pace with your 10 to 12 ships, of course, but we don't want to do it exactly. But we've got four more of the ships that we've ordered after the list. After Encore, this is your new Leonardo class. So four have been orders and two are options. The options are still options, yes. There will be a press conference later on. You will not uh, make a statement on the two. Well, maybe you can join us at the press conference. So we do have quite some growth regarding our capacities. We're quite busy with this, so we don't need to uh, worry about the figures of the competitors. We rather focus on our own figures that they are positive. Please allow me to say, uh, yes, I still believe that you always uh, take into account the competitors because you're in the same business. You need to plan ahead. Where will the ships will be used? What do the others do? Because today we talk a lot about over-tourism, and this destination day is also um, an important day for over-tourism as an issue. So I'd like to ask you, Mr. Tengelo. Do you um, read the business reports of the competitors because they are public so as to get a feeling about profitability, what the future might hold in store? Please do not tell me that you do not read these reports. I wouldn't believe anyhow. Well, I can assure you that we are profitable because otherwise we wouldn't be in this business and we wouldn't invest in further ships. It's a highly profitable business indeed. I think this is the case for everybody who is involved in the business in a very professional way. And well, we are a family run uh, company. It's a uh, company listed in the stock exchange. We always say, well, we do not think in figures only. Sorry, we do not think in quarters, but in generations. And this is something that we felt with regard to the planning of the future regarding the 12 ships until. 2026, and it's a strategic competitive advantage. We do have comp capacities in the wolves. There are not as many in the world which can build these uh, big um, uh, in this big size. So uh, we read that the CEO of Tui uh, was very angry that he wasn't able to build new ships earlier because he would have liked to do it, but it wasn't possible. So we plan in the long term, we're profitable, and we believe in the future of cruises. Yes, I suppose so. You, you personally as well, right? Yeah, that's the famous sleepless nights we mentioned. Mr. Bubolds, do you know where the Leonardo class will be used? Because it's smaller ships. You have to add this. Uh, it's interesting to see this because the new ship class of Norwegian is different compared to the trend with regard to many shipping companies. You've got smaller ships, and this is interesting. You want to be more flexible. Is that right? Yes. And uh, we uh, weren't involved in the competition of having the biggest ship. We rather wanted to see the right relationship on board uh, regarding space and guests. We had the freestyle cruising concept. We wanted to be able to offer a lot of services. And here I think we've found a size uh, which makes us being very 
satisfied and we slightly decrease uh, size now so as to get a good balance be able to use the infrastructure properly and then uh, we've got approximately 3,000 to 3,300 passengers where the ship's a bit too big or it does depend on the market it depends on the market uh, we want to grow and we want to run uh, with the ships we need to have a certain flexibility so as to use the ships uh, we'll have the bliss and the encore so two additional ones they're a bit bigger than the the other ships of the past so we also think about where we will use the ships. Do, do you say that? No, this is nothing that we can discuss before 2022. But you always have to think long term. Yeah, you think, you think. Yeah, OK, that's thinking. Now, your ships are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, that was interesting. The MST Seaside, I don't know whether anybody of you knows that, was uh, handed over in November. It's a very interesting ship, a prototype. And since I'm talking about prototypes, we know that of many dockyards building, or rather um, shipbuilding companies building ships which are rebuilt, so to speak. We have concepts which are then rebuilt. But here we have a, a three prototypes being planned and uh, we'll talk about the LNG ships later then. And uh, out of these three prototypes, we also have uh, two further developments uh, from scratch, I must say. And this MSC Seaside is a completely new concept. And it was uh, very interesting because it has very many outdoor decks, which is unusual for a large ship. That was last November, and it's now in the Caribbean. And uh, that's quite interesting to see because that's very clearly for the North American market. And what I said in my introductory remarks, Norwegian is a shipping company which is uh, coming to Europe, trying to explore Europe and expand in Europe, and uh, MST is doing the opposite. It's a European uh, shipping company going into the US. And uh, that's where they really want to go into business. And then last November in Trieste, we also heard that, OK, uh, we have two larger seaside uh, evolution ships, which we've ordered as well. It was sort of on a side note. And um, so that's also for the North American market. So you are increasing, aren't you? So the ships are getting bigger, yes? We know what the ships are going to look like, uh, which we will have with us in our fleet until 2026. With the world class, we'll have the largest ships. 10,000 uh, passengers, yes, they'll be really big. And uh, we also have different ship types, which are of medium size. The PK class, two and a half thousand passengers about. Then we have the Musica type, where we have four. Then we have the Fantasia ones, which will take about three and a half thousand passengers. So we have quite a spectrum of uh, medium sized to large ships. But you're not building new ones which are smaller, though. And I think that's the difference with you, Kevin, because you started building smaller ships again, which is unusual looking around today. Yeah, well, small, that's always a relative thing. Well, smaller, smaller, not small. They're fairly, lar fairly large ships. And uh, our company, MGL or whatever, it, it's not about size. Not about size, it's about diversity. We want to have a diverse uh, offer, on offer, and that's better and easier on bigger ships than on smaller ones. And we also want to see innovation. And I think with our seaside, that has worked very uh, well. She's my favorite ship up to date, especially since you're so close to the water, and that's really nice. That's uh, very unusual. It's unique. And I'm sure that other market competitors are going to copy us here, but that's okay. I mean, to copy good things. Now, if you say now imitating that, that would be Norwegian because they have the Leonardo. I think you're going to say something about that in a minute. But anyway, <clears throat> you're not imitating MSC. You have a dockyard, Fincantieri dockyard in Italy. And this seaside 
class ship is part of it. Fincantieri obviously also has sold it to Norwegian and to Virgin Voyages, which is um, also now founding a cruising shipping company. So please, you have the floor. Yes, as Michel said, probably in the industry we've had the same idea. But anyway, we began with the breakaway class when we had the waterfront. So we had a broader deck, deck eight, which goes all round. And we had restaurants. And the restaurant then opens up so you can eat outside or inside. And just so that the audience understands, they have this promenade deck, which very often was unused, basically. Maybe it was nice to look out at the sea, but not much was happening there. And you were one of the first to begin to use this space. Well, you could do some research, but I think that we were probably the first who started doing this with this idea in mind because we think that, yes, we are all full heartedly involved in this product and the seafaring aspect and the combination, the, the relationship with the ocean you're traveling on, that has been forgotten a bit because the previous uh, cruise ships, they were, they focused more on the inside of the ship. You could hardly look out. And uh, we wanted to start to break with this and uh, then Fincantieri picked up on this. And of course, we also continue with this idea that's only logical. So you have the Fincantieri design, but smaller. Well, the concept, the idea of opening up uh, the holidays to the sea, to the ocean, that's what we want. Now, I'd like to get back to the question of growth in uh, North America, us growing in uh, North America, Norwegian in Europe. For MSC, it's not quite correct because we are growing everywhere and we want to grow everywhere. On all uh, markets, um, globally speaking, we see potential for growth. Growth, And in the US so far, we were hardly represented. And the American market is the largest uh, cruising market. And we want to be realistic. We don't want to be market leader or number two, but uh, we do want a larger share of the cake, clearly larger than what we have now, which is why we're also expanding in the US. But uh, the seaside, is, for example, seaside evolution, the ships we're building, those are ships uh, which have been conceived not exclusively for the Caribbean, but for the sun. And that's why you can use them in all sorts of setups. Now, the competitors with the hardware, you have large competition. And uh, you said that if you want to be successful, we need to have a hardware solution which is really new. Because uh, you're not well known enough otherwise. Yeah, actually, we had a wow effect here. It's, it's true, yes. Now, before we maybe talk about the German markets, what was your learning curve, or what did you have to adapt to with the MSC product to make it more US friendly so that the Americans say, OK, we like that? There are differences in mentality, I suppose. Yes, there are differences in the mm, different cultures of the various guest groups, of course. And MSC, um, there I do know the market department quite well. We are very well established. We are the only European internationally established uh, shipping company. We try to have a Mediterranean elegant product where you recognize MSC and MSC style. But we're also very experienced in uh, what we offer different uh, guest groups and cultures so that Americans feel particularly comfortable, or Italians, the French, uh, the Brits, Austrians, the Swiss. Uh, was that difficult for you to change your product to uh, make Americans feel comfortable? Well, it's important for us to try to be able to create an MSC experience which would always be recognizable. But at the same time, we, of course, also have certain uh, peculiarities of the Euro American guests, uh, like certain uh, drinks they like to have. 
drink packages or that the meals are adapted to American, uh, for example, American steakhouses or something so the Americans will like it. Just their preferences. Now, I'm not saying this here just because he's sitting here from MSC. I'd like to also be critical because maybe then you won't like me anymore. But uh, we heard a lot about MSC saying that, oh, well, the food, uh, good prices, but the food, whether that's as good as elsewhere, you know, we've, we've heard that uh, people mum mumbling a little bit, which is why I now do want to say that we've had the first feedbacks from the seaside, which were astonishingly positive. So people were surprised. Of course, you do pay a bit more, but the quality is very high. I just wanted to mention this as a parenthesis here. Well, do you want me to say something about that? Now, in Miami, we don't have a, an exclusively American product. We have an MSC experience, which we want to offer everywhere, but with a special American touch to it. And we also have international guest groups uh, starting from Miami, so we have a large share of Europeans, which is why we also still offer an international product, which the Americans also like. Our American guests uh, appreciate that because they have this international flair on board the ship. Now on food, for many years now we have had uh, guest surveys and uh, we can read from the surveys and see exactly where we can still uh, improve the quality. The quality was always good, the food quality was good with MSC, always was, but, truly was, but some problems, especially with the new large ships at the beginning, was the problem with the buffet restaurant. And I'm saying this, I'm being very open about this, and there we had, the, the thing is the guest flow, you have to manage the flow very well so that they don't all go and storm uh, the buffet at the same moment, and we're quite good at it now. So we had a learning curve. The food as such has always been good, but we had this learning curve, uh, but we've finished this now, we've, we've learned our lesson, uh, concerning uh, guest flow and management of the guest flow. So now the guests don't uh, come all at the same moment as they used to do in the restaurant. Now, Kevin, you maybe had the opposite learning curve. Uh, I'd like to ask quite openly, if you as a US American shipping company come to Germany or Europe and you, ha you introduce a premium all-inclusive, which you did, because I think you saw that TUI Cruises did that very successfully, I can say that that's uh, not a secret. People today want, it, want price transparency. All-inclusive today is uh, very much the trend, not just in the cruising industry. And uh, how difficult was that for you, for the Norwegian leadership uh, in uh, Europe, to make it clear to North Americans that we need this? The market here is completely different. Because I know from World Caribbean, uh, the mother company of TUI, World TUI Cruises, when they introduced uh, all, premium all-inclusive, uh, world we was not uh, amused. They said, why should we um, include things in the price where we could, we, we could earn money with? So was that a Herculean labor to get through with that? Well, you've mentioned so many things now. Yeah, well, OK, I talked a lot, but you may talk a lot as well if you like. Well, the question whether it was difficult uh, to push that through. Well, as uh, Michael said, we are, as they are an European international company, we're an American international company. Um, with regards with our guests, we've had a uh, strong market increase with our international market. And three weeks ago, I was in Sydney in Australia. We've had an um, office there for two years now, and it was absolutely successful. 
2.5% market growth in Germany, in Australia, 6%. So there's lots of potential there, and there may be here as well. So we are already an international company. So many of the things Michael just mentioned uh, with adapting the product to within the total product to the local preferences of certain markets, that's the same thing we also do. And uh, of course, with us, the basis is American. With you, it would be Italian. Anyway, as you said, we are a stock-listed company. And then you say family-run business versus stock uh, company. I would say, you know, it, we f it feels like working for a family-led stock company. So Frank Deria is the strong man with Norwegian Toman. He's a former Cuban. And yes, and he built up uh, Oceana. That was his big baby, the one he made big. And now we have all three brands, Norwegian, Bushiana, and, and, and Cruise Line. But uh, the culture is, it still feels like a family run business. And for all inclusive, that was very, very clear. With us, you can say everything. If you have ideas, even from local markets, you can talk about it, but of course, not bullshit. It has to be a good idea, and then you can do it if you have, can make a good case. And all-inclusive was good. I mean, we, we're not doing it because we want to earn less money. Obviously not. It works as a package. We have a situation where we have strong increase in prices. We have very good global demand increasing. It's very balanced. The international, the global product, of course, uh, with a strong background of North America, but also Australia with this strongly growing market, we have lot, lots of uh, demand. But in Germany, you haven't been that successful. Can we say that? I think last year you had the Jade, that was a smaller ship, and there you offered a cruise starting from Hamburg and then with Getaway. That was a big ship um, beginning from Warnemünde. And if you look at ESC, compare it with that, I think, uh, you know, you, you just have a slight smile about that because your figures are quite different. Well, before I leave it at this, we are very successful in Germany, but maybe we have different criteria. We are looking at turnover growth and not so much at a large growth in volume. We do want to grow in volume, but that's not our focus. Uh, we don't want to have especially many people from Germany or many guests from Germany. We want to have quality increase. And of course, we've had uh, an increase in prices because we had this fantastic demand for our products globally. And uh, the German market is part of an international strategy. And we are growing. We have been growing. We grew last year and we're growing this year. And we will be growing here in the German market segment. So yes, we have that. But uh, we have a different approach to the market. And we have this different background. So we have this very strong North American market uh, in the background, which is where you are still building capacities. But that is why the two different companies are so differently uh, oriented. Now, Norwegian isn't that well known yet. I mean, there's always a problem that uh, a US, for a US American shipping company to establish itself with all here. And the same may be true for MSC elsewhere. You have to be known first. But then I think if you compare that, then over the past years, the company, um, if you compare it with Caribbean, which they're now quite you know, involved in moving their location to Barcelona, then we have um, North America, Princess Celebrity, and so on. These are brands nobody knows. So you have maybe at a lower level, but you do have been able to, you have been able to do something to promote US American cruise shipping. But I think the big challenge, as I can see it, is the price difference. MSC <coughs> can be much more aggressive in prices and uh, offer cheaper prices. Is that the correct strategy? Now, if you say that you want to remain the premium segment in the German language market, or would you have to adapt, do you think, so that you can uh, 
hold against uh, MSC or AIDA, TUI Tools, and other competitors. Especially AIDA and MSC, they're already market leaders in uh, competitive pricing. Isn't that a challenge for you? Well, in Germany, we are not starting our business in Germany because we want to be bigger than MSC. We have a completely different starting point. If we're number six, seven, or eight in, on the market, so that's a completely different story. We have a different structure here than the others' uh, competitors have. So when talking about lower prices, that's not our focus. We want product quality. And uh, we don't have a special pricing policy for Germany and say, OK, we have to decrease our prices in Germany or something. No, So that's realistic. That works. Yeah, We focus on our product, on our contacts. Uh, we invest in our fleet, uh, in purchasing with food, for example, trying to have a very high quality, and uh, then try to explain this uh, to the market we are approaching. And you have to explain this. Well, premium all-inclusive is a good vehicle for this to explain it, because everybody can understand that very uh, easily. The Germans understood that. And then they see what we mean. But pricing policy, as I said, is different from our competitors. Now, I sort of heard something here. We do also want to increase in quality and in quantity. Yes, in 2017, we published our current f business figures, 280 million euros uh, turnover in Germany, and thereby we are the internationally first number one uh, shipping company in Germany and one of the biggest in Europe. And. Uh, we had an increase of 10% 2016-17 in quantity. So we were able to um, increase our prices a bit, and we managed that over the past five years. So we want to grow in quality and in quantity. That's our clear target. And contrary to NCL and others, we decided uh, that we wanted to let our guests choose between all-inclusive and cruise only, which is why we have drink packages you can add. We have two different kinds of drinks packages. One is very rich, where everything is included, alcoholic, non-alcoholic, coffee, tea, everything. And then we have a bit simpler package as well, which you can book separately, but you don't have to. But if you like, uh, you can have this price transparency. Of course, you have to pay an, an extra amount of money, but you do have the choice, and you, it's important to you to, for people to have the choice so people can, or you are able to offer a slim product without all this, which means you have uh, lower prices. No, it's not a slim product, because we have the same product as others as well, other shipping companies. We have all sorts of different restaurants they can choose from. We have uh, expeditions. Uh, so the basic product is identical. And beyond that, we have certain uh, extra things you can book, which are here not included in our price, but you can book it extra. We are not the cheapest on the market. But we do have a good uh, um, price quality ratio. And, uh, but uh, no, I think Norwegian has defined itself. It's been two or three years now via the premium se segment. You have this premium all inclusive in that. So, is that a different quality category? Would you say that? Well, I, I didn't want to have an argument here. But I mean, they're two different things. They are two different uh, approaches here. Also in pricing, I mean, we have to say that. You are, on average, more expensive, right? And therefore, you also want to offer something which the market will understand why this is more expensive. Yes. Well, if we look at premium all-in 
Norwegian cruise lines and uh, compare it with uh, our cruise-only prices, then I think there wouldn't be any difference. Well, I don't know whether this was correct or not, but with us, we can also choose. We also have the Just Choose product, which would be Just Cruise, which is just the cruise, obviously. But uh, usually we see that um, people sometimes look at that so that they, they, they have an idea of the pricing, but they don't really book it. They prefer the in all-inclusive price. Now, just the cruise, I mean, we shouldn't uh, be saying just. It's not just. I mean, it's a sensational. It's a grand, great product. And we have uh, breakfast, lunch, uh, dinner, cafe, entertainment. Yeah, I mean, if you compare that with uh, holidays uh, <coughs> on the continent, then, of course, that makes it clear why this is uh, so much liked by people. Anyway, now we'd like to have the audience take part and uh, vote on our next question. I think you can all understand. Please uh, vote. Oh, well, it's nearly 50-50, yeah. Quite balanced. We have another third question. Let's have that one. That's the big challenge. Okay, das ist dann wiederum ziemlich okay, this is quite clear now. Overtourism is a problem. Is that something you have been dealing with? Is it something it may also be a question, an image question, so people have the feeling that we have too many people in the ports? Of course, so the cruising industry, the share of the tourism industry, in, in, in if you compare with the total industry, uh, then it's not. A uh, large share, but uh, still, nevertheless, do you think you have to change something, um, you know, about the image? Well, we have the step we're taking now that we are reducing the size of the ships, and then we say we don't have to go into every big harbor with the other huge ships, but maybe we should have some alternatives, be more flexible with the new ship type we have. And so this is maybe also a marginal aspect of our um, decisions we're making. And otherwise, over-tourism with us, no, it's not yet. It's not much of a topic now. Really not. That's interesting. Well, the typical experience um, examples would be Venice and Barcelona and increasingly also in Hamburg because we can see that the uh, port is in the middle of the city. So this is a topic we have to deal with. But uh, yeah, the share of cruising uh, tourists is, of course, small compared with the rest of the tourists in the city, but the ships are also very visible. And the closer the harbor is to the city, for example, in Hamburg, uh, the more this is an issue and a topic for discussion with overcrowding. Now, Dubrovnik, that has also been uh, mentioned in this context. And uh, I personally have also experienced this. And I must say, yes, it's really, really quite a borderline case. I think we would have to try and uh, not to have too many ships uh, simultaneously in the port and in this city. Is that realistic? Yeah, I think it is. I think it uh, could be organized. And um, of course, here the municipalities will have to also 
manage the harbors, but tourism is also an economic factor, so you'll have to f try and strike a balance. But it is a topic which we take very seriously, and uh, possibly for the larger ships, so we will see a tendency in the future, uh, for example, in Steinwerder in Hamburg, there we have a new terminal, to have uh, the ships a little bit outside the city, out of sight, out of mind, out of sight, out of mind, so something like that. If that's uh, accepted by the cruise uh, shipping industry because they want to be in the city, well, we talk about that with our market uh, accompaniers and uh, the guests are prepared to accept, it seems, that a terminal shouldn't be very close to a city. It's more important to have comfortable um, means of uh, traveling from and to the ship. And then the terminal is a kind of an airport. And then it could be like in Munich, so you, it's 30 or 40 kilometers away from the city center. Now, last question, one minute, and then we're through with our time. If you can, just briefly, luxury versus mainstream. What's the difference in marketing? Is it easy to have a product for the volume market? You both have that, and at the same time also a luxury segment? Well, there are different kinds of luxury clients, and the clients we are approaching are probably those uh, who will be bored on a smaller ship, and they would like to have entertainment uh, as only a big ship can offer, and the diversity only a big ship can offer. But uh, nevertheless, they also want to be able to um, have an area where it's quiet, with a high standard, and so on. So this kind of luxury group would also be suitable for a product where other people also go along. So yes, we have a specific uh, marketing in this direction. But we do that in the context of our total product as part of our concept. I suppose you do the same, or do you want to add something else? I would say no, it's not easy, but MSC can do it with the yacht, the yacht and club. Thank you very much for your attention. We could say so many things yet about this topic. It's a very dynamic sector. Thank you very much for your being here. Thank you. And um, thank the audience and have a very good trade fair. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen, for this very interesting um, discussion of the cruise industry. There really do seem to be a lot of opportunities, um, some decisions to be made, luxury or mass cruise tourism. And it seems the over tourism topic is also important for them when it comes to infrastructure, communication, cooperation with different partners on land. and. I think there's a lot of opportunities for the cruise industry to learn from the, the other sessions here as well, perhaps. So thank you very much. Thank you. And in 15 minutes, we'll be back with a discussion about Airbnb and the sharing economy. So join oh. us again at, at oh, 2. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>